And in the months beyond that, we're going to plan uh, webinars on concept inventory, cyber learning tools and resources, and ways to incorporate evolution across the curriculum. So we're, we're really uh, excited to have you all here with us this, this afternoon and about ready to get started with today's webinar. And, but first, I'm gonna, let me turn it back over to Sherry Potter, who's going to introduce you to the webinar interface. Sherry? Hey, everybody. I just um, wanted to, as promised, demonstrate to you how you can communicate with the presenters and moderators throughout the duration of the call. If you have any technical issues um, or just want to contribute to the dialogue, there's a couple of ways that you can communicate with us. The first is to submit a chat, and you'll all see on your interface on the left-hand side, there's a pretty easy interface to chat in a comment or question that you may have. And we'd like everyone to test the chat capability at this point because you're going to need it really soon. <laughs> so if everyone could please uh, go ahead and chat the city and state where you're calling from today, then we will give each of you the chance to test it out and make sure you don't have any questions. Uh, we've got Virginia, uh, Norman, Oklahoma, Omaha, Nebraska, Pennsylvania, Ithaca, New York, Berkeley, California, Chapel Hill, North Carolina, New York, Houston, and Huntsville, Texas, uh, Rye, Colorado, and Livonia, Michigan, Uvalde, Texas, Illinois, Kansas City, Missouri. Wow, we have people from all over the place. Uh, I'm actually calling in from Sarasota, Florida. Our presenter today is Judy Scotchmore, calling in from the University of California at Berkeley. And uh, Susan and Bernadette in our, are in our Washington and Virginia, D.C. offices at the American Institute of Biological Sciences. Um, so the chat is one way that you can communicate with us. In addition to that, uh, you have the ability to mute or unmute your phone. At this time, we have muted everyone uh, for the purposes of blocking out background noise. But if you'd like to unmute your phone and say hi or ask a question or make a contribution, all you have to do is dial star 7. And I recommend that you write that down. Um, if you'd like to mute your phone again after you've made your comment, you dial star six. Okay, Judy, go ahead and take it away. Okay. So this is really fun uh, for me. I'm sure that uh, mostly, whoops, go back here. <laughs> mostly when uh, people start a webinar, the first thing they say is, I've never done a webinar before. So uh, this is going to be fun for, I hope, all of us. And we're also going to be experimenting with a few things on this webinar since it's the first of the series. So I hope you will be flexible. Uh, one of the things that we're going to um, experiment with is the fact that if I'm talking about how science really works, then I shouldn't just be lecturing to you all of the time. And so I want to do some interactives with you. So how do you do an interactive on a webinar when I can't even see you and I have no idea what your responses are and so forth? Well, that's what we're going to experiment with. So that means that I'm going to be switching sometimes from the slideshow that you're looking at to give you a preview of what's on my desktop, which I have cleaned up a little bit this morning. Um, and then I'm going to be asking you for some responses, and you can use that chat um, feature that Sherry just showed you when you typed in your um, city and state. You can actually respond to me. And I'm going to be starting you off with an activity uh, that you might want to actually try with your students. What's really fun about this activity is it requires no equipment whatsoever, excepting something to write on. But under normal circumstances, you wouldn't be isolated in your, um, wherever you are, <laughs> in your office or your home or wherever. Uh, and you'd be working in uh, a group of two or three, um, uh, talking with your uh, fellow students. And you'd be brainstorming about um, what it is that you think is the solution to this little um, presentation that I'm going to give you. So I'm sorry that you can't do that. You're going to be just chatting with yourself, but you'll, um, that, there's one advantage. Uh, we don't really know who's putting up the results, so you can actually kind of put any answers that you'd like up here. So give me a moment because I'm going to switch from the slides to showing my desktop. So you'll see a bit of a transition on your uh, area, and I have to move this over so that I can see what's going on here. Okay, so at the moment, you should see my desktop, and it should have six lines going across it. So I'm it looks great, Judy, and for those of you who are having some alignment issues, there's a scroll bar along the bottom and the side to help adjust your view so you can see all six lines. Great. Thank you, Sherry. 
So what I'm going to be doing right now is um, these lines actually represent um, six numbers. And your task is to simply figure out what the relationship is among the six numbers. And I'm going to give you the first three numbers, and then as you think you see the relationship, you'll tell me what you think this one is, and this one is, and this one is. So we'll just get started on this, and we'll just see how this goes in this chat format. So I'm going to replace this with the first number, which is a 2. And then this is going to be replaced with the second number, which is a 4. And the third number, which is a 6. And so now your task is, I want you to, based upon what you can see right here, I want you to figure out what you think goes in this fourth slot right here and just go ahead and chat it in right now. So what number do you think belongs in there? Don't be shy. Getting several respondents saying number 8, Judy. I can't see the responses, Sherry. There's a problem here. Okay. So um, you'll have to tell me. Okay. <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> okay. We have so a, whole... a lot of them um, have said eight. Yep, All right. We have a whole slew of number eights, and we have one ten and an eight ten twelve. <laughs> All right. Okay. So now we're going to see how well you did, because the next number actually happens to be a four. So I don't think there was a four uh, shown up there. So what I want you to do now is just looking at the numbers you see now, how does this make you change your mind as to what might be the fifth number? So go ahead and type in what you think the fifth number is now based upon what you can see. I see several number twos, a number eight, a number 10, more twos, a six? Okay. All right. Well, we seem to have quite a number of twos, and interestingly enough, the next number is a two. Okay. So now, based upon this, now, what do you think that sixth number is? <laughs> I got an oops. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that counts. <laughs> I have a couple of fours. I have a number 34. Okay. I, I have a couple of zeros, a six. A negative two, Ooh. four, a number one. Okay, you guys are doing great. I'm glad you're not just staying out there. I was afraid nobody <laughs> would respond. <laughs> okay, well, let's see what it is. I saw a couple of people with the right answer. It's a zero. So now take a good look at those numbers because remember, there's some kind of relationship among those numbers. And we're going to give you another chance. Uh, to see if you can figure out what that relation is. I'm going to start off with three new numbers, and then we're going to apply exactly the same relationship. I'm not going to switch on you. Okay, so I'm going to start off with the numbers um, 5, 7, and 9. Okay, so based upon... The relationship that you think might be true of these six numbers, we'll apply them to the same relationship here. What do you think the fourth number will be in this one? We've had a couple of sevens. Mm -hmm. Lots of sevens coming seven, in. Seven, five, three. <laughs> okay. More sevens. All right. So seven seems to be the most popular number, and I hate to disappoint you. It's a four. Oh. Oh, bummer. Okay, so... Same thing, though, uh, if we apply the same relationship, that 7 wasn't quite the right thing, but what do you think is going to go into this slot? So let's see your ideas coming in for here. This is when it would be nice if you could chat with your partners. Okay, so 1's and 3. Everybody, I have a negative 1, 1, 2, 3, negative 1, question mark, <laughs> negative 3, negative 1. A negative one? Question mark. You've stumped some of us, Judy. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay, negative. well, I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot here, and it's a two again. Hmm. So, based upon what you see thus far with these, this new little bit of evidence, what do you think the sixth number will be? I see zero, 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 zero. Oh, everybody's <laughs> getting very confident. <laughs> All right. Okay. 
Getting it all up there. All right, it is a zero. Okay, so now a few of you may think that you've got the relationship in your mind. So what I'm going to do is, again, start off with another set of three numbers. I'm going to make them a little more unusual this time, but the same relationship should apply. So if you've got it, you've got it. And if not, we'll see what we can do. So this time I'm going to do a seven and a six and a mm, three. Okay, so if there's seven, six, and three, and the same relationship applies, what do you think that fourth number will be? A four? A negative four. A clueless. <laughs> Couple more negative fours. Six? Four, negative one? Negative four, five? Negative two? Okay, all right, let's see what that is. If I apply the relationship, the response, the, excuse me, the answer is, so we had some people who think they got it, so maybe they've got a <laughs> pattern here. So all you negative four people, or anybody else, what do you think is going to be the next <laughs> pair? Ian says it's gonna be a negative six. <laughs> negative three, negative one. Negative two, negative one. One. I think I'm stumping a few people, but. Negative three, we have two negative threes. Another negative three and a negative one. Okay, well we've got a few people who may have it down, okay, because the answer is negative three. All right, so there's at least four or five of you that's got the negative three. So if we apply the same relationship, what will this last number be? Zero. 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 <laughs> zero. Zero. Two. Zero. Okay. <laughs> All right. And it is zero. Okay. Now, if... This would be a little easier if we were all chatting with each other right now, but I'm going to see if you, um, some of you may think that you've got the idea. And so what I would like you to, to do is if you think you've got the idea, would you um, go ahead and chat in, I think I've got it, and then if you don't mind, we'll actually ask you to sort of, uh, we'll have um, Sherry unmute you, and then you can sort of say to the rest of the group, okay, Ian thinks he's got it. Anybody else? We have Courageous Ian. <laughs> Ian, to unmute your phone, dial star seven. I feel like you're dialing in to, oh, Alan thinks he's got it too. Um, it's, if the first number is A, the second number is B, the third one is C, the fourth one is C minus A, the fifth one is C minus B, and the sixth one is C minus C. Okay, so Ian, I'm going to ask you then if you want to test that idea of yours, give me um, three other numbers that you think will really do a good job of testing your idea. So give me any three other starting numbers, okay? Uh, uh, make them so that the math's not too tough on me. <laughs> okay. Eight, um, 11. 11? And three. And three. Okay. So according to your idea then, if this is A, B, and C, then I should be doing what to get this fourth number? Um, three minus eight. Which would be? Minus five. And you are correct. And the next number would be? Three minus 11. Mm -hmm. Which would be minus eight. You are correct. And then three minus three, which is zero. All right, okay, so good job, all right, and so um, what I wanted to, to, to have us do here is sort of to wind you up for how simple it is to get into a conversation about, you know, um, this thinking process of coming up with this relationship, and I actually tried to make them uh, fairly 
quickly that you would get the answer. You can kind of drag it out as long as you would like and change the numbers in any way. But the critical part to this little exercise is now with your students what you would say is, were you doing science? And every time that I've done this thus far, people go, well, yeah. And so then the idea is, well, ask your students to articulate. What was it that you were actually doing that was like doing science? And most likely you'll get conversations along the lines of, well, we were uh, coming up with hypotheses, and then we were getting uh, more evidence, and we were testing ideas, and we changed our minds, and we were talking with one another, and we were uh, sometimes bringing in biases of number patterns we already knew. Um, so there's a very interesting conversation that takes place. But another key question to ask your students is, so what were you doing that was not like doing science? And then you get um, usually less of an exuberant response because they're not sure how to respond, but we might get an answer such as, well, you know, number patterns like this, maybe that's not learning about the natural world, and that can lead to an interesting conversation. And one of the other things that you might get your students to recognize that here, there actually was a really definitive answer that we could find out. And in science, that's not really the case. And that, too, leads to a very interesting conversation. So this is just a little warm-up activity. And I am now going to take away our little number situation. No, I don't need to save that. And I'm going to go back to the slides and come back to this little uh, introduction of so let's look at how science really works. So as I mentioned, that's just sort of a little warm-up um, to get you talking and thinking about um, science and, and what <clears throat> are some of the things that we do when we do science. But this is nothing new, talking about how science really works. Um, you see lots of the things in our national science education standards and benchmarks for science literacy. But teaching the nature of science is something that we have been doing with our students or trying to do with our students for quite a long time. And even uh, at the K-12 level or whether it's at the undergraduate level, there's a lot of conversations about the fact that understanding science as a process is just as important as understanding the basic science content. But some of the interesting things that maybe you're less uh, aware of is that in the learning research, um, there are some pretty clear connections that show that learning the nature of science may also influence and enhance science content learning. So students may be more able to, um, to engage with the science content and actually increase their interest in science and improve um, their decision making. And one of the reasons that we got involved in this project is there's also some uh, preliminary information by Lombroso and others that indicate that if you have a clear understanding of how science works, you're more likely to be open to accepting evolution, which of course was of great interest to us. So there's lots of added benefits to having your students um, understand the nature and process of science, but we've definitely got a couple of problems. Um, first of all, most Americans don't understand the scientific process. And so they don't even have the tools for assessing uh, various claims about how valid they actually might be, and these are important claims. And interestingly, even college students fail to understand basic issues regarding the nature and the process of science. And this just sounds ridiculous because, you know, we teach the nature of science and the scientific method in elementary school, in middle school, in high school, and in undergraduate level, so why don't they get it? Well maybe there's a problem in the way that it's presented. So here's what I'd like to do. You're not off the hook in this participation yet because I'm going to now tell you a story, but you're not just gonna sit back and passively listen. You're gonna need something to write on and something to write with. So find some paper and a pen or a pencil or something like that. And hopefully you've got it ready. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you a story, and I'm going to give you some guidance as to what you're supposed to do while I'm reading the story. And the story happens to be about Walter Alvarez. 
and probably most of you have heard about him. And the title of the story is Asteroids and Dinosaurs, Unexpected Twists and an Unfinished Story. What your job is, as I'm reading, you're going to keep a list of all the things that Walter and his colleagues do that you think represents doing science. And I'll kind of help you out to begin with so you'll get the idea of how you can do this fairly quickly. So we'll get started. Walter Alvarez was in Italy with other scientists looking for patterns and layers of rocks to learn more about Earth's history. He observed an odd pattern. So you might write down on your piece of paper, observed or observation or something like that. Okay, so I'll continue on with the story. There was a clear layer of clay that was dated to be about 65 million years old. That's the boundary between the Cretaceous and Tertiary time periods called the KT boundary. Below the clay, excuse me, clay layer, there were lots of microscopic marine fossils, but above it, there were hardly any. He wondered what happened to cause so much of marine life to go extinct at that time. So he asked himself a question, so you might just write down a question mark. And was there extinction related to the dinosaur extinction that also occurred then? So there's another question. The first thing Alvarez wanted to know was whether the clay layer formed quickly or over a long period of time. If he knew this, he would know how quickly he would know how quickly the marine life disappeared. But how could he measure this? Another question. Well, he asked his father, Luis Alvarez, who was a physicist, for help. So talk to another scientist. You getting the idea now? So sometimes I'll help you and sometimes I won't. So anytime you think that there's, you know, he's doing science, just jot down the words that, you're, that come to your mind, okay? Just keep the list going. Okay, here we go again. His dad suggested looking at the chemical elements in the layer. Some elements make their way into rock layers at a slow but constant rate. By measuring the amount of one of these timer elements, they might be able to figure out whether the clay layer formed quickly or slowly. Luis suggested using an element called iridium. Iridium is rare on Earth, but common in meteors. Meteor dust containing iridium rains down on the Earth's surface all the time. Other scientists, Helen McKell and Frank Asaro, helped them test for iridium in the layer. There were two possibilities. One, clay was deposited over a few years, and if so, they would expect no detectable amount of iridium in the clay. Or the second idea was that clay was deposited over a few thousand years, and therefore they would expect to see some, not a lot, but they would expect to see some uh, uh, developed right there in the clay. Okay. Not only did they find iridium, but they found more than 30 times the amount they expected. This finding made them ask all sorts of new questions. First, they wanted to know if the large amount of iridium, called a spike, was found only in Italy or in other parts of the world, too. Alvarez read many scientific articles to find another location where they could test KT rock layers for iridium. He eventually found one in Denmark and asked a colleague to check it for the element. The results were positive. The spike in iridium was there, too. So whatever happened at the end of the Cretaceous must have been widespread, occurring all over the world. And this led to a new question. What caused these high iridium levels? Back to the literature. Ten years earlier, two other scientists came up with the idea that a supernova, an exploding star, caused the extinction of dinosaurs. Since iridium is produced by supernovas, Alvarez's discovery supported this hypothesis but they needed to test their idea further by looking for other elements produced by supernovas, such as plutonium-244. Alvarez's team searched for plutonium in the cla cla excuse me, clay layer and found it. They thought they had more evidence to support the supernova, but after double-checking their results, they realized the sample had been contaminated. No plutonium existed in the clay, and as a result, they had to reject this hypothesis. Now they had to figure out a new explanation. What could have caused lots of iridium but no plutonium? They came up with the idea of an asteroid impact. Asteroids have lots of iridium but no plutonium. 
perhaps an asteroid hit the Earth during this time. This hypothesis led to a new question. How could an asteroid impact have caused the extinction of dinosaurs and life in the ocean? To investigate this question, they shared ideas with other colleagues, and eventually Luis Alvarez figured out that a really large asteroid hitting Earth could have blown millions of tons of dust into the atmosphere. According to his calculations, this amount of dust would have blocked out the sun around the world, stopping photosynthesis and plant growth. This would have caused a worldwide collapse of food webs, and therefore many animals would go extinct. In 1980, Alvarez's team published their hypothesis linking the iridium spike and the dinosaur extinctions. This caused a huge debate and more exploration. Over the next 10 years, more than 2,000 scientific papers were published on the topic. Scientists in the fields of paleontology and geology and chemistry, astronomy and physics joined the argument, bringing new evidence and new ideas to the table. Many different scientists studied many kinds of evidence to test hy the hypotheses about this ancient event. Their tests included, if an asteroid impact had caused a worldwide environmental disaster, many groups of plants and animals would not have survived. Therefore, if the asteroid hypothesis were correct, we would expect to find a large increase in the number of extinctions at the KT boundary. And we do. If a huge asteroid struck Earth at the end of the Cretaceous, it would have caused a lot of heat melting rock into glass and flinging glass particles away from the impact site. So if the hypothesis were correct, we would expect to find glass at the KT boundary, and we do. If a huge asteroid struck Earth at the end of the Cretaceous, it would have caused powerful shock waves. So if the asteroid hypothesis is correct, we would expect to find evidence of these shock waves, like deformed quartz. And we do. If a huge asteroid struck one of the Earth's oceans at the end of the Cretaceous, it would have caused tsunamis, which would have moved ocean sediments around and deposited them somewhere else. So if the hypothesis were correct, we would expect to see signs of these deposits at the KT boundary, and we do. If a huge asteroid struck Earth at the end of the Cretaceous, it would have left behind a huge crater. So if the hypothesis were correct, we would expect to find a gigantic crater somewhere on Earth dating to the end of the Cretaceous, and we do, the Chicxulub crater on the Yucatan Peninsula. Scientists agreed that the evidence was strong. Dinosaurs had gone extinct, and there was a giant asteroid impact at the end of the Cretaceous. However, scientists did not all agree that the evidence suggested there was a connection between the two. And the investigation continues. Okay, so that was a shortened version of the story, and now here's what you have to do. Hopefully you haven't been just loafing back there, and you've actually made a list of all of the uh, times that you actually wrote down something that sounded like uh, Walter was doing some science. So what I want you to do is just kind of glance at them and sort of make an estimate of the number that you think you have. And so it might be 5, 10, 15, 20, and just estimate, and then again, chat in the number that you've got. Okay, so give an estimate of how many things did you write down in your list. 22, 15, 38, 25. Okay, you're coming in strong. Woohoo! all right. 28, 26, 36, 16, 24. Seems like the right. range is 14 to 38. Well, this is great. Okay. But I'm very confused. How can it possibly be that many? Because I thought that there were only five steps to the scientific method. Perhaps the scientific method is too simple. And that's the point I think we are trying to make and that this story does quite well. Because if our textbooks have something that looks like this in it representing the scientific method, then perhaps this is way too simplified, way too rigid, way too uncreative, and not really what science is like, and therefore probably way too boring. So needless to say, there is a, you know, I'm out in Berkeley, so there's a relatively quiet revolution taking place, but we're getting less and less quiet. And with your voices, perhaps we can raise a little bit more noise. And we would like to suggest that if our textbooks contain things like this in the scientific method, then perhaps they should be torn out and replaced with something that looks more like this. 
Now, what this is, uh, we refer to it as the science flowchart. And you're looking now at a still shot of one of the pages from the Understanding Science website. But I'm going to confuse things a little bit uh, again now because I'd like to show you probably a better way of presenting this to your students, and that would be in a more interactive format. Um, and to do that, I need to return to my desktop again. So I'm going to move away from the slides, and we're going to move back to the desktop again. Okay, and let me move this over here. Hang on with me for a moment. I'm moving my little thing up there. Okay, all right. Now, can everybody see this okay? Sherry, you want to give them some guidelines if they can't see it? Sure, just a reminder that there's a scroll bar along the bottom and the right-hand side if you need to adjust the position of the flow chart in your screen. Okay, so at this point, when you share this with your students, uh, it's great to just simply say, so what do you see? Explain to me what it is that you're looking at. And the conversation will automatically flow. They'll start talking about that, you know, well, there are four bubbles and the names of the bubbles and, and or they'll call them balloons, whatever, and they'll say that the one in the middle is bigger. Maybe that means it's really important. They'll notice all the arrows and the arrows coming back on one another and just let the conversation go. But then if you've read something like the Alvarez story or any other story or you might want to refer them back to something you've actually done in class, and you can say, can you think of one of the activities either that you've done or if you're looking at the Alvarez story that might go in that exploration and discovery bubble? And they'll come up with several different ideas. And then you can ask the same thing. Well, what do you think would belong in the testing ideas section? And then what do you think would belong in the community analysis and feedback? And then what do you think would belong in the benefits and outcomes? Then what you can do is use this interactive version, uh, which I will now just scroll over. This is what it looks like when you're on the website. And you see that exploration discovery is there's a lot more in there. And you'll also see some things on the outside. You'll see things like curiosity and serendipity and surprise. And we don't normally use these terms very much in our textbooks, uh, yet they're a huge part of science and part of why science is so much fun. Um, but then inside the exploration and discovery, you'll see words that we're used to talking about with our students, but you don't see that you must begin with asking a question first, or you must begin with making an observation first. Um, there is no you must begin in a particular place, nor are there any numbers, nor are there any arrows indicating that there's a particular pathway that you should take through this particular section. Because depending upon what you're working on and maybe even who you're working with and who you are, your pathway may be quite different. And science spends a lot of time in this exploration and discovery area. And that's necessary before they can actually get to the area where they're ready to begin testing their ideas, which is the critical part and the core part of science. So that by now there's enough information that a hypothesis could be formed and predictions or expectations stated and then you can actually do some real observations and see how that new data, uh, analyze that data and see if it actually supports your original ideas or not. And then the other thing that is certainly missing from the scientific method is the really important role that the scientific community plays in analysis and feedback. And this is where you can talk to your students about peer review and replication and publication and how scientists come up with new ideas and theory building and so forth. And also, we tend to think of the scientific method as coming up with a conclusion. That's not necessarily the case, and sometimes the benefits and outcomes of science are, are really big. They may end up, end up with you know, developing new technology or addressing a societal issue, but they might be as simple as satisfying your curiosity or perhaps building knowledge um, and that knowledge, we won't even know what that may lead to later on. So this is the kind of conversation we'd like you to have with your students. And when you look at the entire flow chart when it's all laid out, it looks really messy. And, um, but then science really is messy. But it's also creative and dynamic and uh, often unpredictable. And when you introduce it to students uh, in piece by piece, this is really not very overwhelming at all. 
So I want to go back to Walter Alvarez now because the um, story that I read to you was a shortcut version of we, what we actually have up on the website. And on the website, we um, have some, some part of the narrative. And then right after the little piece of narrative, we show where Walter Alvarez is on the chart, in the flow chart. And then at the very end, we show his entire journey. So some of you may have already seen this, but if not, sit back and relax, because this is what Walter Alvarez's journey, the story that I just read to you, actually looks like. And you'll see it is far from linear. It goes all over the place. In fact, it was very unpredictable for him many times around. Back through that testing ideas, and finally, what do we get? Well, we satisfied some curiosity, and we actually also built, built some knowledge. But this is, you know, pretty um, impressive way to get across the idea that science is not a linear, rigid uh, process. So I'm going to uh, end the slideshow again, and then Sherry will probably have already been taking me back to the slides. Okay, and sure enough, good job, Sherry. All right, so this is um, the site that I've just been telling you about, and in the little bit of time that we've got left, I'm gonna take you on a whirlwind tour of the, some of the primary areas of the website that I hope you will go back and further explore. The website was funded by uh, the National Science Foundation. It's called Understanding Science. And as I alluded, alluded to earlier, the reason that we actually got uh, into doing this is with our Understanding Evolution site, we are finding that there is certainly a, a segment of the population that is confused about evolution because they're confused about science and what science is and what science is not. So working with a group that I'll show you in just a minute, we uh, developed this site um, in order to, pro to provide you uh, with tools to help communicate what science is and isn't, and how science works, and the fact that the process of science is nonlinear and dynamic, and science is creative and fun and exciting, and it's also a community endeavor, endeavor, and that obviously science matters and is, and is useful. And as I mentioned, this is a highly collaborative effort. Um, the Museum of Paleontology would not have had the intellectual expertise to build this site because it's across all science disciplines and across all grade levels. So we had an extraordinary teacher advisory board. These are teachers from three different states that teach at all different grade levels. And we also had a project advisory board, and these individuals represent all the major um, scientific disciplines, so geology, and um, chemistry and physics and the biological sciences. And we also have represented here philosophers of science, cognitive psychologists, and those in um, education research. So it has been a highly collaborative uh, project. They all came together and talked about what science is face-to-face, -face, and they have reviewed and re-reviewed everything that has been in the site. So what I want to do quickly is show you a little bit of Understanding Science 101. Um, this is kind of like a, an online course that is, uh, covers a variety of topics. Number one, what science is, how science works, and this is where we introduce the flowchart and go through each of those sections. How scientific arguments are built, and I'll come back to this in a minute. The fact that science is a human and com community endeavor. How science influences, excuse me, how society influences science. Science doesn't work in isolation. It's influenced by the society within which it operates. Obviously, why science is important to us, but also why thinking like a science scientist or using a scientific approach can be helpful in our everyday lives. And one of the things that we also do is we talk about things that science cannot do. So science doesn't make moral judgments or aesthetic ones, and it doesn't tell you how to use scientific knowledge, nor does it draw conclusions about supernatural explanations. Now, when you get inside um, Understanding Science 101, this is what the page kind of looks like. We have the main content over here on the left, and then we have some navigation areas here on the right. And what you find in the right, we were guided by what should go here by our teachers that are involved in the project. 
And so one of the things they said is, please give us a snapshot of what's in this section. I want really want to know if I want to take the time to read it. So what are the big ideas? So we provided that. They also wanted to know if we addressed any specific misconception about science within this content. So we added that as well. And then if you scrolled further down to the bottom of the page, you would see three more areas that they requested. There are links to science stories, which we call science in action, such as the Alvarez story or the one that's mentioned here, Building the Double Helix. And then we offer an opportunity to take side trips where you can uh, kind of dive more deeply into the particular content that we're talking about um, as appropriate to your grade level. And then there's also a, a section where appropriate uh, that we refer to as teach this. And that means that whatever this content is here, we'll give you some tips that are appropriate for your particular grade level of how to introduce this um, to your students. Throughout the site, uh, we use um, cartoons in order to drive home big ideas in a fun way. And uh, we will soon have our image library up and running, and then you will be able to download any of the, our images or any of our cartoons for use in your PowerPoint presentations or handouts or any way. This is one of our favorites because it sort of gets across the idea that anybody's allowed to do science and can do science, but there's sort of a few little rules like a little sign here, all patrons must expose their ideas to testing. Thank you. We use also explanatory diagrams. This is one that helps um, students to understand the logic of uh, the argument, how an argument, scientific argument is built, the statement of a hypothesis, and then what your expectations or prediction would be, and then what do you actually see? Does that match? But in reality, the argument is often assembled in a different order, most likely in this case, cells were spotted underneath the microscope, that probably happened first, and so forth. So we talk about um, the logic of the scientific argument. We provide um, several tools for teaching. This one uh, we refer to as the science checklist. What we found is that um, our, our um, advisory board, when we were all talking about what science is, that we really shouldn't define science, but instead we should try to describe it because it really has fuzzy borders. There's nothing that says, you know, definitively everything in here is science and everything out here is not. And so we list, and obviously the more times you check things off, the more scientific things are. And then we provided several articles or stories that students and you can uh, hold the checklist up against uh, to see how scientific it is. So this is a screenshot from a story about Henrietta Leavitt and astronomy. But we also have um, stories on astrology and cold fusion and intelligent design. And it's up to you and your students to decide how scientific each one of them happens to be. We also have something that we called your science toolkit, and um, these are some kind of guiding questions to approach something uh, in a scientific way. And this is very useful for students to analyze um, science as it, they find it in the media, whether it's on the web or the popular press or whatever. We are continuously adding new science and action stories besides the Walter Alvarez one. We have one on the structure of DNA and one on ozone depletion. And we have just uh, finished the reviews um, for cold fusion and endosymbiosis. And so right now, um, the graphic design is being applied to those, and they will be up for you. Remember, this is uh, not just biology. So uh, you'll find the case studies or action stories in all sorts of disciplines. And we'll be adding to the site continuously. Um, so. Shifting away from EVA 101, another part of the site that I want to make sure that you're aware of is the teaching resources, which you can access in two different places from the home page. And there, again, um, with the help of our teachers, we said, well, what do you want? And we tried to give it to you. So uh, we are supplying a wide variety of tools. Some of them are grade level specific, um, but some are appropriate for all levels. Um, again, they are across different disciplines, and we are trying to make them adaptable um, so that you can use them in any format that you want in your particular teaching um, section. But when you first come to the teaching resource section, you'll also see that we have sort of three pedagogical principles that kind of guide um, what we have supplied here and what we hope will guide your teaching. And these are all, again, from the educational um, learning literature. One is you need to make it explicit. Um, 
our students, even if we engage them in hands-on activities or our undergraduates are doing actual research, if we don't make it explicit to them what it is that they are really doing, it just doesn't stick. And the next principle is that we have to give them time to reflect. So we need to encourage our students to, to examine it, to test and to revise their ideas about what science is and how it works. And what we're finding uh, is that that flowchart is a really excellent tool for both making um, what you're doing uh, that is science explicit and for reflecting on what it is that you're doing. And then the third principle is you can't just introduce it at the beginning of the year and say, well, good, that's done. Um, you really have to keep reinforcing the process of science um, in multiple contexts throughout the school year. When you get to the uh, teacher resource section, you will see that we have uh, built five lounges um, that you can visit according to the grade span that you're most interested in. So here I took a, green, a screenshot of the undergraduate lounge so that you can see some of the things that we include. So we give you some tips for um, approaching uh, the process of science, some sample starting activities, and it's in this section right here that you will see a full write-up of the little brief version of the number pattern activity we started off with, but you'll also find several other ideas of how to introduce this um, to your students. We give you some tips on modifying your current instruction um, and a guide to understanding Science 101 and how you can use that with your uh, students. And then we also have uh, some first-hand reports that we will continue to add to. Perhaps you will write one for us one of these days. This is the one from Natalie Coldell, who's actually one of our advisors, and she was using the resources. She uh, is a bioengineer and teaches at MIT. There is an entire section on the misconceptions that students hold about science and how science works, and so we have listed those. They are accessible uh, easily from the uh, teacher resource section. And then when you click on them, they simply expand so that you see the original misinterpretation and then uh, an explanation that you can help your students better understand um, the actuality of science. Also in the teacher resource section, you will see um, uh, tips for incorporating those tools that we already mentioned, the checklist, the flowchart, and the toolkit. And we provide uh, graphics and PDFs for you to download and to adapt. You can even download a poster of the Understanding Science flowchart. Again, I mentioned that we uh, have a series of starting activities, and so these are all activities that are effective at the undergraduate level. If you scroll down further, you'll run into the number pattern one. And we give some exemplary lessons um, that talk about integrating the nature and process of science into your teaching. We're not expecting you to throw out everything you're doing, but we give you some hints as to how you can better uh, incorporate the process of science into your teaching. And as I mentioned, we update the site on a monthly basis. So I would strongly encourage you to subscribe uh, to our updates on the home page. And that means that you will get um, an email from us on a monthly basis. We'll just let you know what the new resources are that we've added, and you can determine whether they are appropriate for your grade level and something that you want to take a look at. So that was the whirlwind tour. And we obviously hope that you will join our quiet revolution and make it less quiet. Sherry, do we have time for questions now, or should we? do we need to move Absolutely. on? Absolutely. We've got plenty of time for question and answer. Okay. So do we have any questions? Um, if you'd like to chat your question, you're welcome to, and I'd be happy to read it to Judy. Uh, alternatively, if you'd like to go ahead and unmute your phone, the code is star 7, to join the conversation and, and ask Judy anything you'd like to ask or share any insights you may have from using this site yourself. Hello. 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 I'm Gabrielle Forbes from Uvalde, Texas. Um, I was wondering how the students respond to your flow chart. Okay. Um, we have been field testing it in a variety of settings. And remember that um, the site is actually for teachers K-16. 
Um, and since many of you um, teach future teachers, you might be interested in the fact that the flowchart actually has um, more than one version. So we actually have a uh, less complex one for younger students. Mm -hmm. But um, where I think that, that I have been most excited about it is we've been um, seeing some teachers using them in AP biology classes and also at the undergraduate level and also at the graduate student level. And they've been using for really unusual ways. Um, but where first it seems like it's overpowering, if it's introduced to students in um, a sort of logical format, which I just sort of alluded to very quickly in this presentation, none of the words are intimidating and it all seems to make sense. And they're very good at tracing their own pathway and seeing where they actually are in you know, the science flowchart. And one of the things that Natalie um, was telling us about when she was using with her grad students is that she got her graduate students to understand, you know, I'm going to stick around in this exploration discovery bubble for quite a long time, and that's perfectly okay. Scientists do that. It's all right. Um, and another thing that we did is we, um, when we first launched this site, and Sherry can tell you about this too because she was with us, uh, we launched it at the SIGBE meeting in January of 2009 uh, in Boston, the Society of Integrative and Comparative Biology, and they gave us a, um, a booth. And so we were not sure exactly what to do with the booth, but we had copies of the flowchart there, and we invited people, both uh, undergraduates and graduate students and faculty researchers, to come by and um, look at the flowchart and talk about one of their areas of research research and um, chart their, their, their pathway. And it was terrific because every single pathway was different. And so what we're finding is that students are, are really feeling quite free because they're, they're no longer stuck in thinking there's only one way to do this experiment. So this is really helping to move away from that cookbook experiment type of a thing because they might have a different approach and a different idea, and that's how science works. So it's very positively being received. We have an evaluation with BSCS right now that will actually have some real data um, on the effectiveness of this. Um, we should have that data within the next few months, and then we'll be able to share that with you too. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi. Hi. I have a related question. I don't know if I can jump in. This is Laurel Hester. I'm at uh, Cornell, Hello. and I um, teach introductory labs. And so my question is, do you have any suggestions for how we can incorporate this in labs? Because it seems like that's um, even more challenging. So we have a huge lab course, and to really go through all these different, um, you know, it's hard to get the time to go through all these different iterations of science. Um, when you have limited supplies. Do you have any advice there or, or suggestions, or is there part of the website that deals with that? Time is always the biggest issue, and so we recognize that. And again, if you go to that section in the teacher resource section where it says tips for teaching, mm -hmm. um, we will. there are some generalized tips there, but we also have um, in some sections, and we've done this probably more in the middle school and high school, but we would love to begin to add these into the undergraduate level. And these are, you know, simple ways that you can modify a lab. Okay, here's your standard lab that you do in intro bio. And it's a good lab. It's getting across the content that you want. But what can you do to it whereby, in some cases, you might make it more inquiry-based, um, but um, there are other things that you can do, too, that simply draw out, you know, well, this is how, how scientists actually do this. How did they come up with these ideas? Um, the whole idea that, you know, when we are dealing with content, where did that content come from? Um, so a lot of times just even the historical aspect of how we got to wherever you are starting your students is helpful. But I think the tips section may have some things. But this is also the kind of thing that we're really very interested in hearing from you and saying, okay, you know, send us a typical lab and, you know, we can help maybe brainstorm with you and post it up on the IBP site that Sherry will be telling you about. And we can together think of uh, good ways to, you know, integrate the, the process of science uh, better into our labs because I totally agree with you and I totally agree with you that time is an issue. 
Judy, I'd like to add um, a secondary comment to that same thread, which is what you told me about what Mark Stefanski did with his students, mm -hmm. uh, which is at the high school level, but we work right at the college level as well. Uh, the students actually did kind of a meta-analysis of their own lab, so they went through the lab and conducted the experiment, then afterwards were encouraged to sit down with a copy of the flowchart and trace their pathway of their experiment. Could you share a little bit of the insights the students had after going through that exercise? Well, the one that sticks out in my mind uh, the most, I, I think it, because it was so amazing that it came out of the mouths of a, of a high school student, but um, the idea was um, Mark gave them um, pill bugs and basically let them do the exploration and discovery and then uh, wanted them just after a day of spending with the, with the pill bugs, and that was like a 40-minute section. What kinds of questions do you still have? What kinds of things could you actually come up with that you might be able to test some ideas without hurting the pill bugs, et cetera, et cetera? But what um, the students did upon this reflection is they started really thinking about how they approached the problem. And uh, one of the best comments that I was struck by was, a student who simply said, and I won't get the words exactly right, but I realized that my question was way too big. And so I had to pull it down to a much smaller question, something that I could actually answer. And that that's how science works. It's made up of lots of littler questions that finally add up to the answers to bigger questions. Great. Um, the next question we have is coming from, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if I don't know how to say your name right, Miali. Um, Mayali, if you'll unmute your phone by dialing star seven. Yeah, this is uh, Mayali from Shaw University in uh, Raleigh. Um, I was wondering about the uh, the case, like the text that you're reading. How how long, how um, how many minutes is are they supposed to listen to that in order to get all the facts, or it does sure. not really matter. If um, we have done this in, in a lot of ways, I was trying to read to you in a very quick format. Uh, we usually, what we do is, um, there are a couple of things. You can just send the students to the website and have them just kind of go through it uh, on their own. But we also supply two versions of this uh, particular uh, story that I read, one that's um, uh, appropriate for older students and one that's uh, more appropriate for younger students. And one has visuals with it and one doesn't. And one, uh, another version is um, written out in a format with vocabulary out to the side so that it's most uh, more appropriate for ESL students. So we're trying to make this um, uh, appropriate for a variety of audiences. So we're really looking at a two-page um, document. Uh, it's actually a little less than two pages. And um, oftentimes what we would do would be to have students actually read through um, the story themselves. And as they are reading, they simply highlight the words um, that they think indicate um, that Walter Alvarez was doing science. And then as a group, they take their um, joint highlighted words and they plot it through the flow chart and then they compare flow charts to other groups. And so in that way, the students are actually doing all the reading themselves as opposed to me reading it to them. And so depending upon um, how you interact with your students, there's a variety of ways that that can be used. Judy, we have a great question from Alan Kiern asking if you have some examples of evaluating student learning about Science 101. Yes. Um, I'm sorry that I don't have a screenshot of it. Um, if I suppose I could find it on the website and you <laughs> could go while I'm talking, I can see if I can find the exact page and then uh, we can go to my desktop. So let me babble a little bit while I'm doing that. But uh, when you go to the Understanding Science website and I go to my teacher section, which I am doing, and I go to my 13 through 16, and I go to my sample starting activities. All right, so let me see if I can switch to Actually, I come to think of what I meant there. I did have this screenshot on my, hang on, let me go back. Okay. Can you see this, um, this particular, nope, it's the wrong one. You can post a link to this resource as well in the discussion boards. Uh-huh. So the one I want to show you is the starting act. That is the right one. Okay. Um, if you can see this particular screen right now called Starting Activities, that everybody can see that, I hope. 
right there, thinking about science, that's actually a Word document um, that um, asks students to um, define or describe um, science, and that there is right in there, oh, thank you, Sherry, um, that's actually a survey. And um, Anna Finucos uh, worked on this survey uh, with Tanya Lombroso, who is in our cognitive psychology department here at Berkeley. And what they did is they um, pulled uh, questions from a lot of other different surveys and then sort of massaged it into something that would be very useful for the undergraduate level. So this is a survey that you can use with your students to see uh, what it is they actually um, think about science. Great. Um, Mark Gallo wanted to know if you see a difference in majors versus non-majors. Um, I don't think we have um, enough input on the use of the site yet. It's still pretty young to be able to say that. Um, and, and I think that's really an interesting, um, a really very interesting question. I, I don't have the answer to it. Um, I would, my assumption would be that um, there would not be uh, any difference I think, you know, when you are initially introduced to uh, looking at science, science this way, it's first of all going to seem new, it's going to seem different, it's going to seem a little unusual, but then everybody just grabs it and goes, well, that's what it really is. That's what I've been looking for, this portrayal. And uh, as you go deeper and deeper into your science, I think you probably maybe uh, are less metacognitive about what it is that you do. You just do it automatically. But if we can get our students as they are just moving into their, their science to be more metacognitive, I think they'll probably have a better sense and a better enjoyment of science. Matthew Rowe would like to know if you use the flow chart to teach students about pseudoscience. <laughs> um, I haven't personally, but I'm not sure why you couldn't. Um, I think probably the science checklist is a better tool to use. Um, that's that one that I, I showed earlier, um, because that actually talks about, um, you know, what are the characteristics that actually um, allow you to say something is scientific, and that's why we included an article on intelligent design. And so rather than just coming right out and saying, intelligent design is not authentic science, um, it makes much more sense to us to describe intelligent design in as objectively as we can and then to simply hold intelligent design up to the checklist. Um, and that would be able to uh, occur with pretty much any kind of, uh, anywhere on the gamut from, you know, really hardcore research all the way down to, to pseudoscience. So I think the science checklist is probably a better tool for that, but that's been proven to be very, very useful. Great. Um, Brian Schmansky has a question. Brian, would you like to unmute your phone by dialing star seven to ask? I'd like to know um, how this can be reinforced, like within lab reports or literature reviews. Because m my problem is they come in with already the, the linear background, and they're so used to a certain structured lab report. So I'd like to know a way of that they can throw this in to kind of embellish the lab report with this concept. Um, I, I think the um, kind of reflection area. Uh, uh, added to a lab report is really a, a good thing for us to try to encourage our students to use. Um, I think that really the, the scientific method is a good way to write a lab report, but that means that that's not necessarily the way the science is done. And for students to understand that there's a difference between the two is makes really good sense. Um, we want to write succinctly uh, uh, when we want to explain to somebody what it is that we have done. Um, but if we want to explain, you know, how we got there, those are two different things. And it's the how we got there that we're kind of depriving our kids from, from my point of view, and we're trying to make them all follow um, a lab write-up uh, as if that's how science is done. So if the report is something that is uh, comfortable for your students and it's also something that you want to um, actually assess their, their learning on, I wouldn't discourage that. What I would uh, encourage
encourage is for you to add a free thinking uh, question at the at the end, perhaps, and just saying simply, you know, what is it, you know, what was the process that you went through? How did you come up with your question? You might have some guiding questions that just uh, let students think li a little bit more about, you know, what it is that they did. And certainly let them trace their pathway through the flowchart, and hopefully they'll see that following different labs, they're not always following the same pathway through the flowchart. Great. Judy, do you want to go ahead now and um, explain to people why the slide now says, now it's your turn? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I loved your questions. They are really terrific. And um, the purpose of these webinars is not just to um, for us to simply be a one-way streak and you sit there passively and, and um, and absorb things and then say, well, that was nice, and go about uh, your, your merry business the way you were before. We would like to see if you are interested in incorporating some of the ideas that we are presenting. And so don't think of this as homework, but it is sort of a now it's your turn, because we hope that between now and the next webinar, not only will you visit the website, but you will try, um, you know, one of those starting activities with your students. You can go into the teacher resource section, and Sherry will be uh, telling you where all of the um, links are posted, so it'll be very easy to find. Um, and we would hope that you will try some of these starting activities, so that you will uh, have your students talking about how science actually works and what it is that they're doing when they're doing science. You might want to try um, reading the Alvarez story and um, in the same way that I presented it to you or, or in the way that it's also presented um, on the website where students are actually um, highlighting versions and then tracing it through um, the, the flow chart. So we'd like you to, to, to test this out a little bit and then see what it's like and give us some feedback and how did your students respond because some of the questions that you asked me, we don't necessarily have answers to at the undergraduate level yet. So we're encouraging you to be part of our revolution and give it a shot and give us some feedback. And uh, we'll have an opportunity to discuss that, which um, Sherry will explain to you. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that um, design of our experiment, Judy. Um, and I'm really honored, and I really wanted to just reiterate how happy we are to have this particular presentation be the first in this webinar series because both NABT, the National Association of Biology Teachers, and AIBS uh, have, as institutions, endorsed the outstanding Understanding Science resource, and we're really excited to see it grow. And one of the best things about it is that Judy uh, and the folks at UCNP consider it a resource for the community to build and help nurture into being more and more useful as it goes along. So all of the feedback that you guys provide through conducting this experiment in your class and trying these resources and telling us what what your experiences are and, and what you like and don't like and what you need more of will help to inform the further growth of the resource and our ability to serve your needs more. So um, for those of you, most of you who are part of this call have met us before in person. Many of you were participants in our NAVT workshops uh, this past fall in Denver, Colorado. And this webinar series was born as a concept out of that meeting where we were listening to the wants and needs that you guys had as a community and are trying to figure out ways that we can bring best practices and professional development to you um, in ways that are very accessible and will help you feel like you're part of a, a, a community. So this webinar series will occur monthly throughout the balance of this year. We have scheduled some tentative topics that will get us through June, but we're looking for further topics from July through December. And it's really important to us that we know that this uh, webinar is meeting your needs. So following this event, we're going to be sending you an evaluation tool that will help us understand whether or not you've enjoyed this experience and whether or not you'd like more of the same or slightly different variations of the same. Um, we, a, a big part of us, Getting together and building community is to have these opportunities for synchronous discussion where we can chat with one another and share resources, but we also felt that the need for an asynchronous online community would be helpful, and that was the type of feedback that we got when we uh, met you in NABT. Um, so in parallel development with what we've been working on with these webinars is the Introductory Biology Project from Oklahoma University. And I wanted to give you guys a couple of introductory kind of um, steps into that website so we can see how we can use it as a tool to continue our asynchronous discussion. 
Uh, this slide here is just a screen capture of the home page of the website, and I wanted to show you how to navigate to the discussion boards where you can come and join us in conversation after this webinar with additional questions that may arise based on the presentation today, questions that may arise while you're implementing the experiment, or other ideas that you might have for ways to improve the understanding science resource or strengthen its use in your classroom. Uh, IBP has incorporated a discussion board into the website, and um, you can see to directly access the discussion board, there's a link in the top right corner where I've placed a green arrow. To sign up for the discussion board, you would use right here on the home page, there's a link that says sign up. And we're going to be sending you guys a direct link to this website, so don't worry about writing the URL down right at this moment. Once you click on that tab that says discussion, it'll open up a new screen for you where there's multiple forums uh, that you may join and participate. We have set up a new forum to support our conversations today that's titled Process and Nature of Science and in Teaching Introductory Biology. I get to thank Ian Ramjohn, who's a participant in this um, conversation, in setting that up for us. And the um, IVP website is live now, and it's available to access following this call. Once you get inside the forums, you will be able to click on this title, Process and Nature of Science, and I have posted a welcome message for you guys to come and read and uh, reply to. Once you click on Welcome, you'll see my welcome post, and then you'll have the ability to reply with posts down here. So this is just an opportunity for us to continue this dialogue between our webinar calls. Um, we hope that we can build through synchronous and asynchronous interactions, a community amongst ourselves that can help support trying new things in, in the classroom and learning ways to improve the introductory biology education uh, opportunity for students. So, Susan, I'm going to hand the stage over to you. Sure. Thanks so much, Sherry. Um, Judy, thank you so much. Um, this is a, a great opportunity now for you all to jump in, give something a try, and share what's working, what's not, and let us know, let your colleagues know, and through the community, we can everybody can help each other. Um, one of the other things that we are going to be offering everyone who participates in at least six of the webinars is a certificate of participation, basically. We know that your commitment of time and to your teaching is incredibly invaluable, so incredibly valuable. And um, because of that, we want to let uh, the other people at your institution know and recognize this. When we develop this, the, the certificate, we want to get your ideas about it, too. Um, this is really a, a, a multi um, faceted kind of conversation we want to have with you, which is continuing, as Sherry said, from our conversations that began at NABT in November. So we want to get your thoughts. Is a professional development type certificate of value to you? What would help you um, show that you're investing the time? Is this something that, that you need? So we are going to go ahead and do it based on the feedback we've gotten already, but we haven't heard from all of you. So please feel free either share your ideas via email with us or um, even on the discussion board. That would be great. Sherry? That's right. That professional development certificate would be um, signed by AIBS and ABT and UCMP, all as um, supporters of your professional development experience. In addition, NABT and AIBS have teamed up to offer a joint membership classification at a deeply discounted rate from the normal membership rates for either organization. Um, with that membership is an electronic only access to both American Biology Teacher and Bioscience magazines. Um, we feel that as research, as educators, you probably are both researchers and educators interested in your professional growth and development. So we felt that this joint membership classification would be a great way to help you stay current um, with both both identities that you have within your profession. Um, so that membership is now available and it costs $100. Uh, we will make sure to post link and information on how to learn more about that membership class on the IBP Discussion Board website so that you can follow up and learn more if you're interested. Yeah, thanks, Sherry. And uh, the IBP website is indeed live right now. We'll be, as Sherry said, sending you a link to that in our follow-up correspondence with you. So 
as Sherry mentioned also earlier, we have a set of, of webinars in the lineup but we really want your feedback and your input to develop the topics for the future webinars. Um, here you can see the ones that we've got tentatively scheduled. There'll be information about them on the website, our, the AIBS website soon. And if you'd like, if there's something you would like to see presented in this format, um, please suggest it to us. You know, you're more than welcome to contact me or Sherry after the webinar by email. Um, again, in the discussion board. And um, also, you could also provide feedback in an evaluation form. So one of the things we'll follow up with you is a link to an evaluation form, which will, which will capture some pretty specific pieces of information that we're looking to collect about the value. And there'll be some open, uh, there's an open comment space as well for you. Um, those your responses to the evaluation are really valuable to us, and it's really the best way, it's, it's the only way. We can revise, refine, and wait, make our next webinar um, even better and better able to meet your needs. So with that, Sherry. Um, <laughs> Is, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask of any of the presenters or, or moderators of today's session? And if you'd like to unmute your phone, it star seven. I just want, this is Judy Phil, and I just want to say that this was a, a very unusual experience, but it was really, really fun, and I liked seeing the comments come up and the chats, and um, so I think it was really an interesting experiment from the presenter's point of view to try to make an interactive webinar, and I appreciated all of the enthusiastic fours and zeros and things that were popping up as you were <laughs> being challenged with my questions. So thanks a bunch to all of you. Well, thank you to everyone for joining us today. This has been a great experience, and we look forward to a whole year of uh, great webinar offerings to share with you. And please don't hesitate to contact any of us if there's anything we can do to support you with your teaching or um, help you in any way. We really appreciate you coming. Great. Thanks. Signing off now. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.